I just got the obituary entry for my grandmother. She died recently. Uh, she died just the other day, actually, like two days ago or something. And, yeah, it's pretty sad. When I was a kid, you know, my dad mistreated me terribly. And, and my mom was a train wreck in more ways than one. They were both train wrecks, both my parents. It was pretty rough growing up with both of those two people. I didn't know what what love was or what it was supposed to be in any way because they didn't understand it themselves. My two parents didn't, you know. And all of the love that they had was completely dependent upon my participation within this religious group. And the moment that I stopped believing or stopped being a part of this religious group, they retracted their love. They stopped showing it, stopped expressing it in any way. So 18 years old, I leave my house because, you know, I was kicked out. I was disfellowshipped. My mom told me not to come around anymore. She didn't want anything to do with me anymore at 18. I was still in high school. So I leave and I had nowhere else to go. I knew this girl from school and I climbed in her window and lived in her bedroom for three weeks. I've told this story before, but, you know, some people haven't heard it, so I'm going to tell it a little bit again. People probably don't realize what's involved in hiding in someone's bedroom for three weeks. Imagine having to plan when you use the bathroom. What am I going to eat? She was going to her room with food so that we could both eat from her plate, you know. And I, I was, like, using the bathroom in cups because I couldn't go out. It's hard to be homeless, to have nowhere to go, to hide from people like that because I had no other choice. It, she lived at her grandparents' house. I finally found a... a like a trailer to rent. I was renting a room from a guy I worked with at Burger King. Jonathan was his name. So I start renting a room from him. And I formally met her grandmother, whose house I, was, I had stayed in for three weeks. This is probably the first time in my life I ever experienced love from somebody that was not conditional. She just loved people. From that point on, she became like a, a central figure in my life for the rest of time. She grew up in the, like the 40s and the 50s in an area of the country that didn't even have electricity yet. New York City, I think, got electricity. We were the first. We got it in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But it didn't fully spread across the country until, like, the 1940s and 50s and 60s. There were still areas in the country that didn't have electricity even up to that moment. And she didn't. She did not have electricity until she was, like, a teenager, basically. Which is absolutely mind-blowing when you really think about it. She didn't see somebody who was not white until she was older. That's how backwoods West Virginia she was. And despite that fact, she still fought for minorities' rights. She was against segregation despite never having met somebody of another race. She was against the criminalization of gay people despite not having a gay person in her family in the 40s and the 50s. So, anyways, she starts dating this guy at 13 years old. This guy is 16, right? It was a different time. Uh, <laughs> dude's name was Frank. So, anyway, she's dating Frank, and uh, things just kind of fell apart with Frank. So, she starts dating... Frank's brother, Charlie. So Charlie is 18, Sue is 14, and they're dating, right? And eventually they got married, and 
stayed together to the end of time. They were together from the age of uh, from when she was 14 to when she turned 78. So Sue and Charlie really took care of me for my whole adult life. And she told me stories about just a different time in history. You know, when she was growing up, the Red Scare was happening, and they were teaching the girls in school basically how to take care of a husband. And they were teaching the the boys how to take care of a family. So the girl was expected to cook and clean and, you know, keep up with, housework and taking care of children and everything else they taught her during the the red scare era how to change bed sheets when somebody is laying on them in case her husband is fighting in a, a war or something and he's injured she needs to know how to change bed sheets with him still in the bed uh, they taught her how to make shoes out of newspaper. I mean, they taught her all kinds of crazy stuff in the event of, like, a nuclear war. I don't know, just, it's absolutely crazy. Just, the culture was completely different back then. It's nuts. They also taught her that, despite being a woman, she should learn how to read news articles and keep up with current events so that her husband doesn't get bored of her. You know, I never had an attachment to her daughter, D. really. Kylie's grandmother, D. she died not too long ago. I never really had much of an attachment to her. I, I was close to her, I was friends with her. But, you know, when we met, she was an addict, too. I was an addict. We were both addicts when we met. For that reason, I was close to her. Eventually, we both got clean, and we both, you know, pulled it together and everything. But it just... I didn't have the same attachment to D as I did to Sue. And D died recently. D died like I don't know a, a couple months ago, I think. And D said to me, I'm sorry, Sue said to me about D, "Why is Trump still alive? But D is gone. Th the last person to deserve such a thing." I just I I feel compelled to say the same about Sue. Point is, Sue was there for me during the most important times, and she was far more important than my own mother. She just doesn't deserve it. Eventually, when Sue got with Charlie, when they got married, Charlie was a railroad worker. He was in the union, worked for CSX, which is a huge train company in, um, in West Virginia, and Getting into the union was really, really difficult. So anyways, he worked for the union, which means he was paid really, really well, comparatively. This is during a time when he probably made the equivalent of about 80000 a year um, in today's money, give or take. It, it was really good pay at the time. So anyways, she had three kids. Uh, they lived in this backwater area of West Virginia that, like, nobody ever went to. It was just this tiny backwoods spot, right? And they they bought a house together after... It, they had kids and bought a house together. And when her daughter, Dee, was little, she was sitting next to a heater playing with something. And then they all went out they got d a little baby d and they all went out to do something i don't know what and when they came back the house had burned down it had burned to the ground they lost everything every single thing because apparently a piece of paper fell next to the heater or something and just lit the whole place up and just like that everything that they owned was gone so eventually they moved to a different area of west virginia which is where they were when i met them they had a total of three kids. One of their kids, I think the middle kid, um, eventually he himself. He, he himself in, and that deeply affected Sue, like very deeply. She described it as the most painful experience that a human being can ever have, losing a kid. You know, you're not supposed to lose a kid. Kids are not supposed to die before you. 
and for that reason it is the most ex- uh, the most painful experience a human being can have um, this is slightly before I came into their life so I didn't actually know the guy he was 26 when he checked out anyways yeah that that's like a pivotal moment in Sue's life and having to lose D just months before she died herself must have been really difficult so anyways when she got older eventually Charlie retired from the railroad and had a pension and everything so they were doing pretty well Um, but Sue wanted a little extra money to take care of her family buy things for them so she gets a job working at Kohl's the you know the the store like the the retail outlet or whatever Uh, first job she'd ever held she started working there when she's like 65 or something she'd never held a job before in her life and she wrote a letter to the CEO thanking him for hiring an old woman. That was just her style. I'm assu- She was a, a lifelong Democrat, and I'm assuming that that's probably partly because Charlie worked for the railroad and he was in the union. Being a union member means you most likely leaned Democrat. Because, you know, Republicans have been trying to destroy the unions for, like, ever. So, anyways, um, she's always stood for human rights. But I'm a, I am have to imagine that being part of the union most likely had a, a heavy influence on it. Uh, when I first met her, I spent my very first Christmas with her outside of the religion. And... I'd never had a Christmas present before. I'd never, you know, experienced Christmas at all with anybody ever. And she bought me, or she she didn't, like, I had just come into the picture. She didn't buy me anything specific, but she always bought gifts, like extra gifts that she could give to friends or family or whatever else. And she bought a blanket. She gave me that blanket, and it was the first Christmas present I ever got. And I... She always told a story about me walking around with that blanket. She was so happy I appreciated it. She was more important than my own mom. More important than my own mom by far. And I told my mom that to her face. I said, Sue is more important to me than you. She took your place when you left, when you disappeared, when you stopped talking to me. Sue stepped in and took care of me when you didn't. And I think that got under my mom's skin because after that, my mom started showing up to Sue's house and hanging around and talking to her for hours, sitting in the basement, chatting, just befriending her like the manipulative bitch she is. And every time I would have some kind of an argument or or a fight or something with my mom, which wasn't terribly often because I never talked to her anyway. I would find out that she went over to Seuss to hang out with her for a while and talk about how terrible I am and all that stuff. But Sue never did turn her back on me. Never. She always respected me and loved me despite being an ultra-religious nutcase. Sue. Sue was super ultra-mega-religious didn't accept evolution, um, didn't accept all kinds of stuff, like traditionally evangelical, except didn't hate anybody for anything. Despite being super ultra-religious and knowing that I didn't believe any of this stuff, she was still close to me, still loved me, and appreciated me and wanted me around despite that fact. That's what I mean when I say unconditional love. And that's what I mean when I say Jehovah's Witnesses don't offer that. That's one of the key qualities of of cults. They don't offer unconditional love. That's not an aspect of it. That's not a component of it. If you believe differently from them, if you break their belief system or or break the rules that they want you to adhere to or whatever, they withdraw their love that's the whole bit at no point despite sue being super religious at no point did she ever do that 
Sue didn't hate anybody for anything. There was not a hateful bone in her body. And she was one of the most religious people that I have ever met in my life. But hate was not a part of it. She managed to love Jesus and love others simultaneously. Something that a lot of ultra-religious people in the U.S. can't figure out today. The reason I'm talking about this in the first place is because they just sent her obituary to me. She was born in 1944. I was a pallbearer at her mom's wedding. Kylie's mom's great-grandmother. Kylie's great-great-grandmother was a pallbearer in her funeral. Did I say wedding? Yeah, I was a pallbearer in her funeral. I carried the casket, one of six. I mean, I've been in this family for 15, 20 years. They consider me one of theirs. Or Sue did, at the very least. And, you know, after all the years of just making a mess of my own life, uh, of doing drugs and everything else, finally getting myself clean, she stuck by me through all of it. Unconditional love. is Something cult members and you know cult leaders simply don't understand they just don't and they never will this is something that you know i didn't know was missing until i had it it's something that many ex-cult members will never experience it's something completely foreign to them a foreign concept it's like showing somebody from 500 years ago a computer or a phone. They don't understand. They, they have no idea what this is or what it's for or what it does or, or what it feels like or, or looks like or anything. Unconditional love is something that you, you can't understand until you have it. And you can't understand unless you lose it. So anyway, Sue deserved it the least out of any person alive in my opinion.